Then mother of the sons of Zebedee came to him with her son and kneeling before him, she asked a favour of him. And he said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Declare that these two sons of mine will sit at one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? They said to him, We are able. He said to them, You indeed drink my cup, but sit at my right hand and one at my left. This is not mine to grant, but it was to those whom it has been preferred by my father. When the ten heard it, they were angry with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones are triumphs over them. It will not be so among you, but whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever be- wishes to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of the Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Well, good morning, everyone. Please excuse me, I'm recovering from a cold, so hopefully I will speak clearly and you can understand me. Thank you, Abby, for that reading, and what a great passage it is. Don't you just love James and John's mum, Mrs. Zebedee? I think this passage is like the definition of a mama bear attitude. And I don't blame her. She's got two sons to think about. She wants the best for them. Um, She's keen to secure their position and uh, that they get what they deserve. And, you know, they've been fully signed up to following Jesus. They've left everything. And she wants to make sure that investment's going to pay off. And uh, when we read this passage in isolation like this, that can feel maybe a little bit selfish, a little bit opportunist, perhaps, on the behalf of James and John's mum. And, uh, but, you know, you have to remember that James and John were definitely part of Jesus' inner circle with Peter, even amongst the 12 disciples. And in the previous chapter, had we read that as well, we would have seen that Peter made this comment to Jesus about the fact that they'd left everything to follow him. And Jesus replies in verse 28 saying, "'When the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne,' You who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So, you know, with the talk of thrones and being honoured in the kingdom of heaven, perhaps James and John and their mum can be forgiven for wanting to get early in early on the seating arrangements, get their towels on the thrones perhaps and uh, don't the other disciples have a reaction they're like absolutely furious you know they're like they asked what although I do wonder whether they're just jealous that they didn't think of it first perhaps and uh, that my Jesus might say oh go on boys since you are so nicely you can have those thrones that's all right I love the drama, and I'm really hoping that The Chosen will cover this scene. Uh, If you don't watch The Chosen, definitely watch it, because uh, I think it would be excellent. But before we go any further, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the ways that you teach us about the kingdom of heaven and the ways that you teach us about how we should bring that kingdom to earth. Help us to have ears to hear from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, I want to focus primarily on verses 26 to 27 of this passage. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. And the subtitle of this morning's talk, as Alan mentioned, is Serve to Lead. And I want us to look at three questions. One, How do we lead? Two, how do we serve? And three, what is God saying? So one, how do we lead? I think it's easy when you hear a subtitle like serve to lead to kind of dismiss it if you don't immediately see yourself as a leader. But of course, in reality, we are all leaders in some sphere or another. Some of you will have professional titles that have leadership head of, director of something, and some of you will have leadership responsibilities in your church circles, in your social spheres, and all of us will be role models of some kind to our children, grandchildren, nieces and nephews, peers, 
friends, colleagues. And the truth is that as Christians, we are all called to be Christ's ambassadors, his representatives of heaven on earth. So I'm afraid that none of us get let off the hook when it comes to the label of leader. And I'm pretty sure you've all been in environments when there's one negative person and it impacts everyone. And similarly, I'm sure you've all been in environments where there was a really positive person that impacts everyone. So we have to acknowledge that we are all playing a leading role. So that brings us to our second question then, how to serve? Well, what I want to offer you this morning, if you only remember one thing, is that serving, and for serving we can substitute the word loving, if serving or loving is primarily, that it is primarily an attitude of our hearts and not an action of our hands. Serving is primarily an attitude of our hearts and not an action of our hands. Now, in two chapters' time, if we were to skip on to Matthew 22, Jesus will be asked that famous question, which is the greatest commandment? And he answers by explaining not only which commandment is the greatest, but how we can fulfill it. He says... The first commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And then he adds a second commandment, which he says is just like it. And poaching from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, he says, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus appears to be saying that loving God is inseparable from loving people. In fact, if we don't love others, the implication here is that we can't really love God. The two cannot be separated. And John himself reiterates this in 1 John 4.20 when he says, If anyone says he loves God but hates his brother, he is a liar. But how do we love and serve our neighbor as ourselves? Now, before I want to answer that question... I want to add two important caveats. Firstly, this talk is not about abusive relationships. So if someone is behaving abusively towards you, then the priority for you is to be safe and not to focus on how to love and serve them better. So that's caveat one. Caveat two is Jesus does not call us into burnout. So if that's where you're at, then this talk is not about how you should be doing more. And your first focus should be about seeking help to get out of that place of burnout. And it can be cliched and overused, but that image of needing to put on your own oxygen mask before helping others is really worth listening to. But back to our question of how can we love and serve others as ourselves? Of course, we already know the answer to this question, don't we? We need to love, treat, and serve others in exactly the same way as we would like to be loved, treated, and served. And when I first started thinking about this topic, my internal dialogue went, hmm, I spend a lot of time serving other people. Uh, I do this all the time, I do this, and I do this, and I do this. And I felt the Holy Spirit gently convicting me and drawing a distinction between my responsibilities towards the people I have in my life, the caring roles that I have, and the stance we take in our hearts towards all people. So not just the ones that we have responsibilities for, but everybody else. So this is our attitude towards all people. And I think sometimes we can water down our understanding or our rationale for loving our neighbor into something much weaker, like being nice. But being nice is neither a fruit of the Spirit nor an instruction in the Bible. Nice is polite, but it is a terrible substitute for kindness, compassion, 
being forgiving or understanding. There are no shortcuts to loving others, no matter how much we'd like there to be. But I recognize it's not easy. Let's face it, sentiments like, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, survival of the fittest, someone snapping at my heels, it's every person for themselves. These phrases are part of our everyday language for a reason. They reflect truths about how things tend to go in the world. Last week, Joya spoke about the way that the early Christians lived out community life, supporting one another and sharing what they had without the need for layers of hierarchy and with a posture towards giving and serving to one another. And this message from Jesus that we're hearing today and that early church way of living would have been extraordinary to those who witnessed it so unlike anything they'd experienced before. And you might expect that after 2,000 years of following Jesus under our belts, that Christians would have really nailed this one. And yet, in 21st century, self-first, consumerist, materialistic culture, it feels just as alien as ever. So what is the problem? Is it the structures and the systems of society that need to change? Well, yes, probably, but that's not what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is giving each of us individual responsibility to position our hearts towards loving and serving others. So that brings us to the third question. What might God be saying to each of us today? Well, of course, the short answer to that is I can't possibly know what God is saying to you, but I will say fairly confidently that there won't be one of us listening here or online who hasn't got something to work on. And if you're willing to be honest and to listen, then the Holy Spirit will point out which priority area you should be looking at. But this is where it can get a bit uncomfortable because it requires us to examine the selfish parts of our lives. Every day, we make choices in our lives about what role serving others will take in our decisions. So, for example, we are loving ourselves and our immediate family, perhaps, when we make choices that bring us prestige, pleasure, ease, comfort, more money, and future security. Nothing wrong with those things. And we are loving others outside our immediate family when we make choices that provide goods, services, or opportunities to marginalized people. Protection for God's creation, justice and democracy, truth, peace, and kindness. Jesus' words imply that this second list is just as important as the first. In fact, in these last two verses, it suggests that at times the second list should take center stage. We need to be the servant, to be the last. That isn't just make sure that we serve others as much as we serve ourselves, but about putting ourselves second. Now, we might think that we usually do quite well in this area, but... I'm sure we've all been selfish, haven't we? We've seen an opportunity for ourselves or our children, perhaps, to get ahead, jump to the front of the queue, towels on the beds, coats on the chairs, whatever we need to do to secure that thing we want. We might take advantage of someone else's failures at work or in our social circles to help damage their reputation when it could be advantageous to us, for example. But nowhere is the selfish ambition of humankind seen more obnoxiously than on the school run. Now, I don't know if you've done a school run recently, but please don't park here, drive in constant use. Pfft. Double yellow lines, no thanks. Driveways, whatever. 
gaps so that ambulances and fire engines can get through, <laughs> who even cares? Uh, hatchings, that's basically an invitation to park. <laughs> but <laughs> don't think that it's just the drivers on the school run. Have you been in the shop? Maybe you've been at Squires. There's a long queue. Someone opens another till. There's four people in front of you, but you're nearest to that till. There you go. I'm over here. The front. Sorry, unlucky for you. Anybody, anybody done that? You've been in the coffee shop. You've seen there's one table. There's three people in front of you. You've sent the kids. I'm only saying these things because I've done them. <laughs> Last weekend, I went to Godalming. I got to the car park. There was one space left. It wasn't really big enough for my car, but I was really determined. I got the kids out. I said, you're not going to be able to get out of the car when I've got in this space. So I do pride myself on being able to park, right? So I'm, I'm backing in. I'm backing in. It's, it is... Well, I had to breathe in really hard to get out of the car. And it was only when I was walking away from it that I wondered whether the car next to me, whether it was driver's side or passenger side, because they weren't going to be able to get in that door. Thankfully, it was passenger side. Would I have stayed if it had been driver's side? I might have done. I can't be, I can't be sure. I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, <laughs> the point is that we all do selfish things. And maybe, you know, in this week, if you catch yourself doing one of those things I've just listed, maybe you'll chuckle to yourself about, <laughs> about the fact that we do have these selfish traits. But it's not just physical things, is it? So much is what happens in our thoughts and our words. We're quick to judge others, but would expect understanding for ourselves. We're quick to give solutions when we would want someone to listen to the complexities of our situation. We assume malicious intent, but want other people to believe that we're just doing our best. We expect grace and to be let off the hook when we make a mistake, but we hold others accountable to very high standards. Do we sometimes position other human beings as different to us, so that we can exclude them from needing our love and concern? Do we look for opportunities to show love, big and small? Hold a door open, pull the neighbor's bin in? Do we freely give time, energy, money, commitment to people and places that need it? What does God see when he looks at the orientation of our hearts? Perhaps I can invite the band to come back. There's a phrase Alan sometimes uses, and he used it this morning. He invites us to allow the Holy Spirit to roam our hearts. That image makes me think about the cupboard under the stairs, or the loft, or that drawer, or the shed where we shove things so that we can't see them. What does it mean to give God free reign in our hearts? To tell him that there's nothing in our lives that's out of bounds for him to see or speak to us about. It brings a new dimension and new possibilities to our relationship with him. The Holy Spirit starts to move freely in our lives when we take every decision to him first both the ones where we serve and love others and the ones where we serve and love ourselves. We become more in tune to living life in alignment with the ways of Jesus. And sometimes the hardest place for us to show love or serve the needs of others is in our closest relationships, particularly our spouses. And that might be something that God is drawing your attention to. Whatever it is, we know we can take it to him and he will make our path straight because that's what he promises to do when we submit all our ways to him. If you're able, would you please stand? <coughs> Sorry. Maybe today you feel like you're on top of all these things and you're doing well 
at loving and serving others. But if God is nudging you about anything at all and you would appreciate prayer, then please ask for it from myself or Alan. We'd be honoured to pray for you or ask someone else you feel comfortable with. Let's just pray to close. Father God, thank you that there isn't a corner of our lives that you don't already know about. Thank you that you understand every layer of complexity that we have to deal with. You see every aspect of our pasts that have shaped our present. We invite you this morning to roam our hearts and examine how we love and serve others. Would you help us to be people who lead and influence our families, professional circles and social circles with love, kindness, compassion, generosity and forgiveness? Prompt us this week when we reach moments of decision making that impact how we love and serve the needs of others. Help us not to simply prioritize ourselves. Thank you, God, that there is no situation that is too difficult for you to make a way through. In Jesus' name, amen. So oh. 
Yeah. 